I'm going to be talking to you today about anomalistic psychology. Uh, and just to give you a little bit of background, I'm Professor Chris French from Goldsmiths, University of London. I'm the head of the Anomalistic Psychology Research Unit. Um, and I've been interested in weird stuff for a very long time. Um, and even weirder, I'm interested in weird stuff, but I don't actually believe in most of it. So that's even really weird. Um, for 10 years, I edited The Skeptic magazine, so you can probably guess what kind of a perspective on the paranormal you're about to get. Uh, but an important part of scepticism, I mean, scepticism is right at the heart of science, and an important part of scepticism is to always be open to the possibility that you might be wrong, that new evidence might come along that makes you revise your opinions about things, your beliefs about the way the world is. Uh, and so in that spirit, I'm always very keen just to see whether maybe we could get some really convincing evidence of, of psychic abilities and that kind of thing. So I often like to start off these talks with a little experiment just to see how psychic my audience is. So I'm going to see if I can transmit a thought from my mind into your mind. So I'm going to keep it very simple. I'm going to think of a number between 1 and 10, not 3 because that's too obvious. So a number between 1 and 10, and I want you to just make a mental note of it. Okay, so here we go. Number between 1 and 10, but not 3. Okay, now there's a lot of people here. Nice, nice big audience. So obviously some of you will get it right just by chance. So we only get ecstatically excited if it's more than about 10% of you. So could you put your hand up if you thought of the number 7? Oh, that's, that's very good. You're a very psychic audience. I'm impressed. Very good. Right. Oh, well, I'm, I'm encouraged by that. I'm going to try another one. This one's a little bit more complicated. I'm going to think, this time I'm going to go for a two-digit number. It's less than 50. It's two odd digits, and they're not the same. So it could be 15, 1 and 5, both odd digits, not the same. Couldn't be 11. Both are digits, but they are the same. So the first number that comes into your head that fits that description. Two, less than 50, two odd digits, not the same. Okay, now. Okay, did anybody think of 37? Oh, that's very good. Very good. Did anybody think of 35? I'm sorry, that's my fault. I thought of 35 first, then I changed my mind. <laughs> I do apologise. So... <laughs> now... Is that really any kind of evidence of psychic ability? Well, no. <laughs> um, what it is technically is what we refer to as population stereotypes. There are lots of situations where it feels as if you're making a free choice from a number of different options, and your intuition tells you that, therefore, the frequencies of response across those different options should be more or less equal. And it just doesn't work like that. The responses cluster in predictable ways. So typically, with that first example, about a third of your audience will go for the number seven. In the second example, about a third will go for 37, and then about another quarter will go for 35. So you can throw that little joke in. Now, you can, <laughs> you can exploit these kinds of things either to claim that you have psychic ability when you haven't. Of course, it doesn't prove just because something that looks like it might be psychic, we know it isn't. That doesn't prove that paranormal powers don't exist. But it does at least demonstrate that sometimes what looks as though it might be psychic actually isn't. It's got an alternative explanation. You can exploit this in magic tricks as well. So we'll try one more little demonstration along these lines. I want you to have a look at those cards and don't necessarily settle on the first one that you feel drawn to. You can change your mind, but I do want you then to pick one now and concentrate on it. So concentrate on just one card. And now here's the magic bit. I'm going to take one card away and I predict that your card has now gone. Put your hands up if your card has gone. <laughs> Oh, you're incredibly predictable. You're... <laughs> now, in actual fact, as some of you may already know, that little demonstration doesn't rely on population stereotypes. There's a different principle involved there. I'll let you figure it out for yourselves if you don't know it already. Um, but there's a little lesson even in that, because there are some... Mentalists, some conjurers who appear on stage or on TV doing amazing things, and sometimes they will actually explain how that effect was achieved. 
And sometimes the explanations that they give you are actually true, accurate. But other times, they are what we psychologists refer to technically as a load of old bollocks. <laughs> so I just thought you'd kind of be, on, be aware of that. Okay. So what is anomalistic psychology? Well, this is the rather wordy definition that we have on our unit website. Anomalistic psychology may be defined as the study of extraordinary phenomena of behaviour and experience, including, but not restricted to, those which are often labelled paranormal. It's directed towards understanding bizarre experiences that many people have without assuming a priori that there is anything paranormal involved. It entails attempting to explain paranormal and related beliefs and ostensibly paranormal experiences in terms of known or knowable psychological and physical factors. So, there's really two strands to what we do. The main strand is fairly sceptical in its approach and we're basically saying, as a working hypothesis, let's just assume that paranormal forces don't exist. Can we explain the full range of ostensibly paranormal experiences um, in, in psychological terms? Can we come up with explanations? And not only that, can we test those explanations? Wherever possible, can we produce some empirical evidence that supports our alternative account? So that's one strand. That's the major strand of what we do. But we're not so dogmatic that we say we know paranormal forces don't exist. As I said earlier, and I meant it, an important part of scepticism is to always be open to the possibility you might be wrong. And so there is another strand of our research where we directly test paranormal claims. Now, it's only a very short lecture today, so I can only give you a couple of examples. The first one I'm going to show you is an extract from a TV series that Richard Dawkins presented a few years back called Enemies of Reason. Uh, I'll show you the clip and then I'll make a few comments on it. Alleged paranormal effects. The so-called evidence for psychic phenomena is not robust, but will o' the wisp the more we look at it, the weaker it becomes. The alleged detection of water through dowsing is not obviously ridiculous. It might work, but does it? The only way to tell is through a rigorous experiment. How does dowsing work? That's the number one question, and nobody can answer you. Well, I reckon that I'm convinced that something is helping me to douse. One of the earlier chaps thinks it's God. How, how do you do it then? How, what, what's your principle of that? I think the question, and I expect God to respond in the way that I understand. I'll, I'm going to expect the right hand one to point to the camera and the left hand one straight forward. One... Yeah, OK. Look, Very look, good. it's following him round. Yeah. And have you done the test yet in the tent? Yes, I did. Yeah, and what, what was the result? I was going to get six or eight, 100%. Yeah, and what happened? One. So what do you make of that, then? He's having his laugh, isn't he? <laughs> he loves a joke. Yes. You don't realise. <laughs> do I get second guys? Oh, yeah, you can have as many guys. The psychologist Chris French thinks there may be a simpler explanation. He has devoted his career to investigating claims of the paranormal. And now he has set up this test for dowsing, a properly controlled double-blind trial. In each of these rows, just one container, chosen at random, holds a bottle of water. All the rest contains sand. Neither the dowsers nor the tester are allowed to know where the water is until the boxes are opened. So there are no unintentional giveaways. Have another go. <laughs> Safeguards like this make the double-blind trial one of the crowning achievements of scientific reason. OK, put it on the end one then. Number six, on six again. I'd say so. OK. Right. What you'll typically find when you talk to dowsers is they'll give you lots and lots of anecdotal evidence, lots of stories about how they discovered a leak sure. in their, yeah. their neighbour's pipes and, and so on and so forth. But there are always other possible explanations there. Yes. What we're trying to do is set up conditions which would rule out yes. any of those other yes. explanations. But then we get down to the, the very fundamental basic issue, can the dowsers actually do what they think they can do? Yes. I think it's four. No, I think it's four. So, shall we see how well you've done? This is really sand. In that case, in that case, I can't do this. This is the waters in number five. 
sand again. <laughs> this time, guess was bin number three, and this time water, you're correct. Well that's water. Oh, that's sand. Yes, we've actually got two Final trial. It's sand again. I'm in that case, I'm 100% wrong again. Uh, well, you've got one right on out of six, which is what we'd expect by chance. So far, they're performing pretty much in line with mean chance expectation, okay. in other words, guesswork. Yeah. So no one has scored more than yeah. two hits out of yeah. six. Three. Three. The people you've been testing, do they understand why they're being put through the double-blind procedure? I think once we've explained it to them, then they appreciate why someone who is perhaps sceptical or doubtful about their claims would see that that was necessary. What's interesting is it doesn't actually tend to dent their confidence at all. Which suggests that they're completely sincere. I, mean, that I think they, they are completely sincere. Yes. And that they're typically very, very surprised yes. when we run them through a series of trials and actually say at the end of the day, well, your performance is no better than would expect just on the basis of, of guesswork. And then what typically happens is they'll make up all kinds of reasons, yeah. some might say excuses, as to why they didn't pass that particular test. I feel the whole test is wrong. I'm shocked beyond words that this has happened. But I did say from the outset, couldn't we just sort out some grey blocks and some scaffold boards yeah. so that I can walk above it, which is what I would routinely do and I've yeah. done for 40 years. Yeah. Who knows where or what bottles were in what tubs. That's the whole point, the isn't it? That's the whole well, yeah, point. But if you understand dozing like I do, you'll understand that everything leaves an image. This state of denial is extraordinary. Even when confronted with hard fact, these dowsers prefer not to face up to truth, but retain their delusion. Now, we were generally quite happy with the way that they, they edited our contribution to the programme there, but there was one very important bit that they missed out. Because before we did the double-blind trials that you saw there, we did a series of what we called open trials where we told our dousers, we want to make sure that the conditions are fair to test your claim, so can we just make sure you get the reaction that you expect? Here's a bottle of water, here's a bottle of sand, use your imaginations. Um, put the dousing rods over the water, the dousing rods would cross, which is what the dousers would expect. Over the sand, nothing. Okay, that's great. Now we're going to put the bottle of water in a container and close the lid. Bottle of sand in a container and close the lid. Do you still get the reaction that you expect? Over the water, nice reaction. Over the sand, nothing. Of course, they knew the water was here, the sand was here. What is it that explains why the dousing rods cross when they know where that's supposed to happen? Well, it's something called the idiomotor effect. Putting it simply, they are moving the dousing rods without being consciously aware of it. It's non-conscious muscular movement. And I was reminded as I came in today, and I saw that nice picture of Michael Faraday outside, he was one of the first people to actually look at this. He looked at it in the context of a phenomenon called table tilting, which arose at the time of the Victorian heyday of seances. And table tilting was alleged to be a way of getting into contact with the spirits. The sitters would put their hands on a small round table and ask questions of the spirits. And on a good session, the table would begin to shudder. And on a really good session, they could end up chasing it around the room, trying to keep their hands on it. Um, and Faraday was intrigued by this. Um, he designed some really wonderful experiments to try and figure out what was going on. There's essentially two possibilities. One is that some external force, maybe spirits, is moving the table. The other is that people are moving the table without being consciously aware of the fact. So I'll just give you one example of one of the studies he did. Instead of having people putting their hands directly on the table, he had sheets of waxed paper. So that was on the table, then put your hands on top of the sheets of waxed paper. Now supposing the table moves to the right, then there are two possibilities. One is it's an external force, in which case the hands will drag behind the table and the wax sheets will be spread out towards the left. If, on the other hand, they are actually moving the table, albeit unconsciously, then the table will drag behind the hands and the wax sheets will be spread out to the right. And you can guess what result he actually found. <laughs> Okay, I'll give you another one, just one more example of uh, one of the ways in which we attempt to test psychic claims. 
Um, these two lovely ladies here are professional psychics. They claim that just using their psychic ability and nothing else, they can tell complete strangers things all about themselves. Um, this was a test that we carried out around about Halloween in 2012. You can see in that image there um, on your left, Mike Marshall of Merseyside Skeptics, who now works with Simon Singh. Simon has set up the Good Thinking Society, Simon Singh, the science writer, and myself. And although the experiment I'm going to describe to you is not rocket science, it still needs an awful lot of people to actually do it properly under properly controlled conditions. So credit where it's due. How do you test a claim like this? Basically, we got a number of volunteers to come in and have a reading done by our psychics. Now, if you are a psychic and you're doing a reading for a 14-year-old girl, it will no doubt be very different to a reading that you might do for an 80-year-old man. Okay? They're going to have different interests, different preoccupations, etc., etc. So, firstly, we insisted that all of our volunteers were female between the ages of 18 and 30. Here's three of our five volunteers that we had on the day. Um, but also, you can tell a lot about a person from looking at them. Are they stylishly dressed? Are they more casual? Blah, blah, blah. All those other things. So, we had our uh, sitters behind a screen. And now I hasten to add that our psychics were quite happy with these conditions. There's no point in doing the test if the claimant says, well, I can't operate under those conditions. You're just wasting everybody's time. So we always double-check that. Also, there was no communication. They didn't see the person they were doing the reading for. They didn't directly question them. They just sat there, picked up on the psychic vibes, and wrote down their readings. At the end of the day, therefore, we had two sets. We had two psychics, remember, two sets of five readings. So we got our, our sitters to come back, read through each set of readings. They didn't know which one had been done for them, but obviously if the psychics can do what they say they can do, there ought to be one reading within each set that has lots of personal information, lots of accurate information about that person. So that was essentially the test that we did. Um, we had five volunteers, as I say. Um, to pass the test, we said you have to get five hits. All five would have to be chosen, but four out of five would have been statistically significant, and we would have been very excited by that. What did we actually get? Well, one of our psychics got one out of five, that's what you'd expect by chance, and the other got none. So, no evidence there of psychic ability. Okay, now, um, when I first started doing this kind of research, one attitude I would sometimes come across from other scientists was basically, why are you wasting your time on this stuff? <laughs> we all know that telepathy doesn't exist. We all know people aren't being abducted by aliens. Why are you, why are you interested in this? Well, firstly, I don't, in any society you look at, anywhere in the world, at any point in history, people do report weird experiences. People do make these claims. And levels of paranormal belief are very, very high. So... If we, particularly as psychologists, well, one thing, that might indicate that maybe some of these claims are actually true. Maybe some of these paranormal claims really are true. If that is the case, then science, more generally, ought to get over its prejudice and just study these things in the way that we study any other part of the natural world. If, on the other hand, it's actually the case that paranormal forces don't exist, we can learn a lot about human psychology by trying to figure out what's going on when people have these experiences. So either way, it's worth taking them seriously. And for us, as a psychologist, the fact that so many people believe in them and so many people, a smaller proportion, but still a sizable minority, claim they've had direct personal experience of the paranormal, it's a part of human experience, so we can't ignore it. We, we, we want to try and understand it. Now... One of the themes that runs through anomalistic psychology is the theme of cognitive biases. Our cognitive systems are amazing. You know, you can do things with every second of your waking life that the most advanced computers as yet cannot do. Um, and we can do some of the things. They can play Go better than you and things like that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the whole set of things that you have, the things like recognising people, uh, perceiving a three-dimensional version of the world around you, all that stuff, you know, we're still some way from that in terms of artificial intelligence. But we do know that your cognitive system, everybody's cognitive system, is subject to certain biases that can kick in under certain conditions and make you misperceive things, misremember things, misinterpret things. 
And it's possible that some of these biases may actually be relevant to explaining why sometimes things happen to people that they think can only possibly be explained in paranormal terms, when in fact, maybe there are alternative non-paranormal explanations. One of these biases that has attracted some attention in this area is the fact that we're all really lousy, intuitive statisticians. There are lots of situations in everyday life where you have to make judgments based on probabilities, and we're just not very good at it. Why is that relevant? Well, it's relevant because very often, not always, but very often when somebody makes some kind of paranormal claim, the obvious counter-explanation from miserable skeptics like me is, well, maybe it was just a coincidence. So you have a dream about something, and then a couple of days later, something happens in real life that bears a striking correspondence to that dream. Was your dream an actual glimpse of the future in some paranormal way, or was the match just a coincidence? Or you're thinking about somebody you've not seen for, for a long time, and the, the telephone rings, you pick it up, and it's them. Was that, again, evidence of some kind of spooky psychic link, or was it just a coincidence? I think people don't like coincidence as an explanation for many reasons, but a couple of them are, firstly, whether you're a believer or a skeptic, if you're the person that something like that happens to, it has an emotional impact. It's that there's a wow factor to it. It's the kind of thing you'll tell your friends about. You won't believe what happened to me, blah, 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 blah. Um, so when, again, some know-it-all skeptic like me comes along and says, oh, maybe it was just a coincidence, you want to thump them. It's understandable. <laughs> um, but secondly, you might take a more rational approach, and you might, in some circumstances, actually be able to come up with a reasonable guesstimate of what the probabilities are, and it might literally be millions and millions and millions to one. How can that just be a coincidence? And when you start and think about it a little bit more deeply, you'll realize that, yeah, actually, a lot of the time it must be coincidence. Think about it. There are officially more than seven billion people on the planet. That means even if everybody on average just remembers one dream per night, that's seven billion opportunities for a match to take place. What would be really spooky is if no one ever had a dream that appeared to come true. That would take some explaining. That would, that would be difficult to explain. The fact that it happens is exactly what we'd expect on the basis of the law of large numbers. The chances of winning the national lottery, one in 14 million. We're not surprised when people win. We're not surprised because we know so many people play the lottery. It's just the law of large numbers. The telephone telepathy example. How many people do you think of in the day? How many names go through your head and the phone either doesn't ring or the phone rings and it's somebody else? You don't even notice it. It's a non-event. But when the phone rings and it's the person you were thinking of, oh, wow, spooky. Um, I mean, there might be other factors that come in as well. There might be hidden causes. I mean, it seems, this seems to be a terrible year for um, famous people dying. You know, it's not, it's not been a good year so far. Um, but supposing there's an event like that where um, yeah, there's, there's a news story one night about some rock star that's just been taken ill or who's just died. Uh, and that gets you thinking about the time that you were at university and you used to really like going to watch that band with your best friend. And you've really lost touch with that friend now. And you're going back and you're thinking about the good old days and you're reminiscing. And the next day you're still kind of vaguely thinking about those good times and the phone rings. And it's your friend from all those years ago that you haven't heard from. By this time, you've forgotten why you were thinking about him. And what you don't know is he saw the news last night as well, and he's been thinking of getting in touch with you. So, you know, there's that hidden cause element. Anyway, uh, how do we study this? Well, there's lots of different ways, but one is with various kinds of problems uh, based on probability. Some of you may have heard of the birthday problem. The basic question here is how many people would you need to have at a party just randomly selected to have a 50-50 chance that you've got at least one pair there with the same birthday? By the way, if you're having a party, don't just randomly invite people. It'll be a rubbish party. They won't know each other. They'll have nothing in common. But if you were to do it, what would be the chances? Um, 
Well, you think about it, if you've just got two people at your party because you've got no friends, um, you've got one chance in 365 that they will have the same birthday. Uh, we'll ignore leap years to keep it simple. If you've got 366 people, you're absolutely certain you must have at least one pair with the same birthday because if the first 365, by some strange quirk, all had different birthdays, you've now used up all the dates of the year. The next person must match someone. So somewhere between 2 and 366 is this magic number where you have a 50-50 chance. If you ask people what that magic number is, they'll typically say, oh, 180, 200, 120, it's 23. And that strikes most people as being far too low, but that is the actual answer. Okay, so it turns out that people who believe, we're all really bad at this, but it turns out that people who believe in the paranormal, there's some evidence from some studies that they tend to be a bit worse than people who don't believe in the paranormal. So they're more impressed when a coincidence occurs and therefore think there's, they must, there must be some other explanation. It can't be just a coincidence. Another reason you might believe in the paranormal is because you've actually been to see a psychic and you've had a reading, and the reading was amazing, and it was accurate, and it blew your socks off. How could they know that stuff? Um, well, maybe they're psychic. Who knows? None of the ones we get into our laboratory seem to be, but hey, <laughs> maybe that's just bad luck. But there is a technique known as cold reading, which is used by deliberate con artists to convince complete strangers that they know all about them. And obviously, it's, if you want to set yourself up as a fake psychic, it's a very useful skill to have. On the... BSc psychology program at Goldsmiths, I teach the students about cold reading so that when they graduate and they can't get a job... <laughs> um, anyway, what is involved in cold... By the way, I should say at this point, and I genuinely mean this, I am not saying that all people who claim to have psychic powers or all astrologers or all tarot card readers are deliberate con artists. I genuinely don't believe that they are. I think a lot of the time they are used in a kind of form of cold reading unintentionally without realising that's what they're doing. Some of the, um, certainly I think you know, some of the big name psychics who have to deliver night after night on stage, Akora, <coughs> sorry, just clearing my throat there, um, that they probably are knowingly using deceptive techniques. Um, but, okay, what, is, what are these techniques? Well, cold reading involves a number of different aspects. I've only got time to give you a very broad outline. One of them is something known as the Barnum effect. The Barnum effect is the tendency that people have to accept vague, general and ambiguous statements as being descriptive of their own unique personalities. This is something that's been known about in psychology for many years. It's sometimes called the Fora effect after the first person who first studied it. This was back in 1949. And this, we'll do a role play now. I'm going to use my amazing psychic powers to do a reading, and it's just for you. It's not for anybody else in the room. Okay. But what I'm sensing with my amazing psychic powers is that you do have a great need for other people to like you and admire you. You have a tendency to be critical of yourself. You have got uh, a great deal of unused capacity which you've not used to your advantage. While you have some personality weaknesses, you are generally able to compensate for them. Disciplined and self-controlled outside, you tend to be worrisome and insecure inside. At times you have serious doubts as to whether you've made the right decision or done the right thing. You prefer a certain amount of change and variety and become dissatisfied when hemmed in by restrictions and limitations. The next line is my favourite. You pride yourself on being an independent thinker and do not <laughs> accept others' statements without satisfactory proof. <laughs> you have found it unwise to be too frank in revealing yourself to others. At times, you are extroverted, affable and sociable, while at other times, you are <laughs> introverted, wary and reserved. Some of your aspirations tend to be pretty unrealistic, and security is one of your major goals in life. Now, that makes a fantastic classroom demonstration because you can give the students sealed envelopes, say, we've had a friendly astrologer who's done a little personality profile for each of you based on your individual birth details, get them to open it up, rate it on a five-point scale for accuracy, and virtually all of them will give it a four or a five. And you may say, well, hang on, the thing is, that is actually an accurate demonstration of an accurate description of most people. If you didn't think that describes you, you're probably a psychopath. Um, <laughs> so, 
why are they wrong in saying that it's accurate? Well, they're not. What they're wrong in saying, if you ask a second question, to what extent does this describe you as a unique individual versus to what extent does this describe everybody, they think it describes them as a unique individual, and that's where the error is. Now, there's a lot more to cold reading than just general Barnum-type statements, but I really don't have time to go into it all because I can keep an eye on the clock here. Um, Another phenomenon changing the onto a completely different topic again, just to give you a flavour of kind of anomalistic psychology. Uh, one of the other things we're interested in is a phenomenon known as sleep paralysis. Now, sleep paralysis in its most basic form is very common. Um, it's when we, we typically find, for example, that about 40% of our first year intake say they've experienced this at least once in their lives. It's when you're half awake and half asleep and you realise that you can't move. Uh, there'll be people in this room who've had that. Usually it lasts a few seconds and you just kind of snap out of it. You put your hand, quick show of hands if you've, had, if you've had sleep paralysis, yes? You need to see a psychiatrist urgently. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. I'm joking, I'm joking. Um, it's actually, it's, it can be a bit disconcerting, but usually that's, that's all it is. But for about one person in 20, or at least up to one person in 20, there can be associated symptoms that make it much, much scarier. You might get a sense of presence. You might feel as if there's someone or something in the room with you, and whatever it is, they don't mean you any good at all. You might get hallucinations. You might hear voices or footsteps or mechanical sounds. You might see lights moving around the room or dark shadows or horrendous, monstrous figures. You might feel as if you've been dragged out of the bed. You can turn into a full-blown out-of-body experience. Or you might feel something breathing on the back of your neck. And bear in mind, you can't move. So that can be obviously absolutely terrifying. There's often difficulty breathing, a sense of pressure on the chest. And maybe the intense fear is just a perfectly reasonable reaction to all the other stuff. But there is also a suggestion that the amygdala, the part of the brain that deals with threat and danger uh, and fear is also overactivated during these experiences. Now, we understand in broad terms why it happens. It happens during something, the, the, the like REM sleep, the REM stage of sleep, rapid eye movement that is typically associated with dreaming. And when you're in REM sleep, during the normal sleep cycle, the muscles of your body are actually paralyzed, presumably to stop you acting out the dream. But what happens here is that something goes a little bit haywire. Putting it simply, it is as if your brain wakes up, but your body doesn't. And so you can see that you're in your bedroom, you can't move, and you've got all this weird dream imagery coming through into normal waking consciousness. And the result can be a terrifying episode of sleep paralysis. And it's not surprising that people often interpret this in terms of demons, ghosts, even alien abduction. If you ever talk about sleep paralysis, it's in the contract that you have to show these pictures. Um, this is a famous picture called The Nightmare by Fuseli from 1781. It's a brilliant depiction, brilliant portrayal of sleep paralysis. You've got the weird horse peering through the grapes. You've got the demon sitting on the chest. You've got the pressure on the chest. And interestingly, if you are susceptible to sleep paralysis, you're much more likely to have an episode if you sleep on your back than in any other position. But to be honest, if you sleep in that position, you're asking for trouble. I mean, that's just silly. <laughs> and Another depiction of sleep paralysis, 10 years later by Fuseli. She's still in the same position. She's learned nothing. Okay, one of the really interesting things about sleep paralysis is the um, different cross-cultural interpretations. If you, I mean, if you look around the world, you can see the same core phenomenon is being interpreted in, through different belief systems. Just to give you a few examples, there are literally dozens. In Newfoundland, they talk about the old hag who comes and sits on the sleeper's chest and suffocates them. In Japan, again, it's a nocturnal spirit attack. They call it kanashibari. One of my favourites is in St. Lucia. They call it kokmar. It's the spirits of unbaptized children that crawl onto the sleeper's chest and throttle them. So do sleep well, all of you, tonight, won't you? <laughs> Back in Europe, in the Middle Ages, it was sex-crazed demons who would come and have their wicked way with you while you slept. I should be so lucky. Um, <laughs> the male version was the incubus. That translates literally as one who crushes. And the female version was the succubus. Um, the suc in that picture, I'm not sure which one of the two of them is more shocked, actually. But <laughs> anyway... Um, it, it, this it actually, sleep paralysis seems to be a common route for alien abduction claims. The, the UFO literature 
will often say, if you've had this experience of waking up and you couldn't move, and I'm oh, sorry, my Fitbit's just telling me I've done 10,000 steps for the day, so that's nice. <laughs> if you, wait, you, you couldn't move, you had this sense of presence, then you've probably been abducted by aliens and they've wiped your memory for it, because they can do that, you know. Um, anyway, um, you then go to seek the services of uh, a hypnotist to get regressed back, thinking from too many Hollywood movies that this is the way to uncover repressed or hidden memories. What it actually does is it provides the perfect context for the formation of false memories based on fantasy, imagination, bits of things you've seen in films, so on and so forth, all woven together. And then the narratives are believed to be true. And interestingly, it's the same techniques that are used whether you're talking about recovering alien abduction memories or past lives or satanic ritual abuse. And there's very, I think it's very good very likely that we're dealing with false memories in all those cases. Okay, I want to finish up now because I'm aware that the time is running on. Um, one of the themes that runs through anomalistic psychology is the importance of what we call top-down processing. Put it very simply, the way that your beliefs can actually affect your perception, your memory, and so on. Um, one way in which this manifests itself is in a phenomenon known as pareidolia. As it says there, it's a type of illusion or misperception involving a vague or obscure stimulus being perceived as something clear and distinct. And one of the things that we very often see in ambiguous visual stimuli is faces. I mean, you'll have experienced this, look at patterns on wallpaper or stains on the floor or the patterns in wood grain. If something looks a bit like a face, we see it as a face. I mean, most of it is fine, it's no, it's no big deal, but sometimes people kind of give it more significance than maybe they should. I'm just going to give you a few kind of fairly light-hearted examples just to finish the talk. Um, here's a very famous example. This is a cinnamon bun that some people think bears a striking resemblance to Mother Teresa. <laughs> so, this is nun or bun, the immaculate confection. <laughs> If any of you can't make it out, there's a nice little animation there to help you. This is a more recent example. This is a, a grilled cheese sandwich, uh, which someone took a bite from, as you can see, and then thought they could see the Madonna. I think it is the Madonna, rather than Madonna, looking back at them. Put it on a in a little container on the bedside cabinet, left it there for 10 years, and then sold it for $28,000 on eBay. So it's worth keeping your eyes open for these things. Okay, I'm going to finish off with the most powerful demonstration of top-down processing that I've ever come across. It's in the auditory domain, and it relates to the claim that there are satanic messages embedded in rock music. This is a claim that's put about by, particularly by... American Christian fundamentalists. Um, and the idea is they think that even though you cannot hear the messages when you play the record forward, you can only hear them when you play the record backwards, they think that that can still have an influence, presumably, and tempt young boys and girls from the path of righteousness into sex and drugs and even more rock and roll. Um, now, there are websites you can go to, and they're really great fun. What you typically find is you'll play the backwards clip and you can't make out what the message is. And then you read it, or someone tells you, and you play it again, and you think, yeah, I can kind of hear it now. Um, and of course, it's top-down processing. Once you know what you're supposed to hear, then you've got that expectation. Now, there has to be a kind of top of the satanic pops, and for me, it's definitely Led Zeppelin. Um, so I'm going to play you a clip from Stairway to Heaven. First of all, I'm going to play it forwards for no other reason than I like it. That's all there is to it. I'm going to play the clip forwards, then I'm going to play the same clip backwards, and your task is to tell me what the satanic message is. And I predict that unless you've heard it before, you will get maybe one or two words, but most of it will sound like backwards gibberish. Now, there's a very good reason for that. It's because it is backwards <laughs> gibberish. But then I'm going to tell you what the message is. I'm going to play it again. And the second time, it will sound completely different. You will hear the message as clear as a bell. You will wonder how you missed it the first time. The reason you missed it the first time is it isn't there. Right. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Here's the, um, the forwards clip. Okay, now, under the ethical guidelines of the British Psychological Society, if you do not want to run the risk of becoming the next recruit to Satan's army, you can leave the room now. 
It's too late for me. I sing the backwards version to myself all the time. So. Right, here we go. Uh, sorry, no, we don't. Here we go with the backwards version. So listen out for the satanic message. <laughs> Any offers? Satan. Right, and again, it's top-down processing. What's the word you're most likely to hear when I'm talking about satanic messages? It's Satan. But according to the websites that believe in this kind of thing, this is the full message. Here's to my sweet Satan, the one whose little path would make me sad, whose power is Satan. He'll give you 666, supposedly the devil's number. There was a little tool shed, I can explain the tool shed, <laughs> where he made us suffer, sad Satan. I'm now going to play the same clip again, I promise it's the same clip, uh, and it'll sound completely different. You'll hear the message. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much for listening. I've, run, I've no overrun. I apologise for that, but I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Have you discovered any phenomena where you find experimental evidence for its existence, but you haven't yet found a rational explanation for it? For it. <laughs>